Yasmina, um, and I'm here to talk about how I conduct technical interviews and how I want people who work for me to conduct interviews. Having worked at big companies and at startups as an engineer and as a manager, I've done a lot of interviewing. I've gotten to make many nifty things, DNA scanners, inertial measurement units for airplanes and race cars, toys for preschoolers, a gunshot location system for catching criminals, assorted medical and consumer devices. I'm an embedded systems engineer. I write software for all sorts of nifty gadgets. As for in interviewing, I started right after school when, HB, when HP sent me back to my college to do preliminary interviews. It was kind of a vacation from my normal engineering work. However, it was really at the startups that I got a lot of practice interviewing. Uh, startups grow quickly, and the need for new people is often desperate. So I got plenty of opportunity to interview all sorts of people, hardware, software, QA, technicians. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to pause for a second as, uh, Yasmina, my connection was reset and I can't see the slides any longer. All right, no worries. We'll just have you go ahead and refresh there and we'll just have everyone stand by for just a moment, folks. Apologize for the technical issues here. We would like you to know, folks, if you do have questions for Alicia and what she will be talking to you about today, please put them in the group chat. Just type them in there. It's that little red icon at the bottom of your uh, little toolbar on the console. Type it in, send it in, and we'll make sure she sees it later for Q&A. Back to you, Alicia. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, but just a little bit more about me and why am I giving this talk. It's because I wrote a book for O'Reilly, buy the book. Uh, and instead of review questions at the end of each chapter, they're interview questions. With most good interview questions, there's no single answer. So instead of giving any sort of answer, I give the things an interviewer would look for. I'll give you an example later, but that's why I'm giving this talk. Um, also, because I really like to work with good people, and someday might have the opportunity to work with some of you and want you all to know how this is going. So what about you? Uh, I didn't get much chance to talk before, but I suspect you're someone who's been asked to conduct an interview, maybe for the first time, maybe you've done it before, but you aren't getting what you need out of it. And I suspect some of you are job seekers who quite correctly believe that knowing how an interviewer thinks will help you ace an interview. However, when you give one, it won't tell you if the candidate is a great person to work with for the next five years. It can really only weed out most of the people who probably can't do the job. And that's pretty wishy-washy. That's why there are multiple interviews and multiple interviews, interviewers and interviews. The goal of this presentation is to give you the confidence that the impressions you get are a pretty reasonable estimate for how the candidate will work out in your team. Uh, Yasmin has already mentioned questions a bit with the whole preface it with Q. I have some things I want to say so I can live up to the advanced billing, but this is not me blathering for 45 minutes while you all listen quietly. How, on the other hand, if I try to keep up with your group chat, I will spend all my time chatting with you. So every few slides I'll stop and see if there are questions. Uh, if there is a white question mark in the upper right of the slide, that means by the end of that slide, I'll ask for questions. Yasmin is going to feed them back to me in something that looks like a bug tracking system, and I can mark them answered and then they disappear, or I can let them linger until they get to an area that's better suited. Enough preliminaries, though. Unless there are questions, let's talk about some things that big companies do for interviewer, interviews that might apply to you. Ah, there's a test question. Excellent. That one's done. Marked. Uh, big companies have many advantages when they're hiring. The Human Resources Department is able to weed out many people who just aren't qualified at all. And they have many people to draw from to conduct the interviews and spread it around. They often have staff to teach you how to do this. 
But some things big companies do can work for little companies or little teams that don't have that sort of support. One thing they did in my group at Agilent was to have the candidate give an initial presentation. It was 20 to 40 minutes, and the candidate chose whatever they wanted to talk about. It was open to all of the interviewers and anyone else who might be interested. Not only did it break the ice both for the interviewers and the candidate, it gave everyone a flavor of how the whole day was going to go. And it gets some of the basic questions out of the way, too, like why are you leaving your current position? Another tactic is some teams break up the responsibilities, letting one person focus on the candidate's creativity, and another person analyze their people skills, another do the technical details. It requires trust between your teammates, knowing they can adequately figure out how to cover their assigned area. Another way to go is to have multiple interviewers per candidate. This can be pretty intimidating to the candidate, but you'd be surprised at how well it works out allowing more of a conversation than a one-on-one -on -one grilling. If you have never conducted an interview before, this is a good way to try it out. And the last thing you might want to try is to have a coding test. Some places, they're one to four hours. They just verify programming skills. Assuming you're hiring for software engineering. If it's something else, you might have some other mechanics sort of skill test. I tend to think I can get this information from the interview, but if you're not sure, it can be worth trying. On the other hand, make sure your engineers all take the test so you have a baseline of what to look for in new candidates. Make sure the test is fair and complete. Before we go into the in-person interview, uh, let's take a look closer at the beginning of the process. It starts with evaluating resumes from a slush pile. Uh, usually done by the team lead, it's an arduous process of just reading all of the jargon and trying to compare, is this resume better than that one? Once that's kind of done, the phone screen uh, happens. Time is money. If you can weed out an unqualified person in a 20-minute phone screen instead of a six-hour interview, it's well worth it. But before calling anyone up, I suggest making a standard set of questions, technical questions and interpersonal questions. For technical, you can use instant message to write code over or choose one that doesn't require code or drawings. One type of technical question that works pretty well on the phone is uh, answer bingo. Choose something relevant to the skills of the candidate, or the skills the candidate should have, that also has a fair amount of jargon. In embedded systems, I can ask, well, what are the parts of an ISR? And the very first thing a candidate's going to say is, do you mean interrupt service routine? That fills in three slots on my bingo card. I don't really print bingo cards, but you get the idea how this works. And since the goal of the phone screen is to get two or three candidates who might be worth bringing in, it isn't a matter of giving them an answer right away at the time of the call. Just tell them you let them know. And if you don't bring them in, do let them know. Send a polite note. Thank you for your time. I enjoyed speaking with you. The company has decided to explore other options. It's how you want to be treated, right? One really good thing about phone screens is they tend to give you less bias in the initial round. If you can't see a person, you can't unconsciously make judgments based on their skin color or dress. Which gives me a pause to talk about something that's pretty important when hiring. So many times the goal, the one that I hear a lot, is I want to hire another one of me, so I have less work to do. I want them to speak the same language, have the same cultural background so the idioms and in-jokes are understood. I want them to have the same reference frame because it makes things go faster. I just want a clone of me. This attitude is pretty short-sighted. While you may be completely awesome, in the long term, diversity pays huge dividends by providing more points of view to a problem. Imagine all the engineers you work with, seated around a round table, grouped together by how they approach a problem, how they think about things. If you put a problem in the center, do you get a 360-degree view of it or just a little tiny snapshot? We need the arguers and the mediators. We need the ones who think in a straight line and the ones who go in circles or jump around. We need the people who grew up with a different idea of what the word inexpensive means. 
a person who travels at light speed, and the people who can make sure they're going in the right direction. It isn't about diversity of skin color, age, or gender, or anything like that. It's diversity of thought that's critical to great engineering. Funny thing, though, the bodies get different experiences based simply on the bodies. So to get diversity of thought, you need diversity of everything else. It's very hard in a small company. They need to move fast, and lacking diversity makes it feel like you're going faster because you don't have to explain why something is important. But faster is not success. You can shoot yourself mighty, you can shoot yourself in the foot mighty quickly. But I'm going to get off my soapbox and uh, make sure that there are no questions about what I've talked about so far. No, pause, pause. Okay. Um, so in-person interviewing. Finally, somebody's coming in for, to see how things are going, and you want to know if they're going to work out for the job. Someone had to organize this. If it was you, I sympathize. If it was someone else, respect and appreciate their efforts, whether it's HR or a manager or a team lead. Where it is an hour for you, what with 15 minutes looking at their resume and 30 minutes of talking to them and 15 minutes of writing up your opinion, it's probably that hour plus a whole day of being on call in case anything goes wrong for your organizer. And, you know, it's basics of being a professional. Don't be late to your interview. It shows disrespect to the candidate. Don't run over. That's disrespect to your whole team, everybody who comes after you. At least skim the resume before you get there. It is pretty embarrassing to walk into an interview for somebody you already know. Make sure you haven't at least worked with them in the past. And do not bring your cell phone. Don't even consider answering it. The candidate has taken the time to be there for several hours. They aren't being paid for this. Show them they're important, or the good ones won't want to work with you. On the other hand, remember, be in charge. You run the interview. Be strong. Fake it if necessary. You control where the interview goes. I think the best way to do that is to start with a plan. Even if you aren't doing the group interview as a team, figure out what you personally want to know from the whole process. And the questions I think are most important are, can they do the job, and can I work with them? The traditional way to figure out if the candidate can do the job is to make sure something similar is on the resume, and then ask a technical question that indicates they can do the basics of this sort of thing, just to make sure the resume is on the level. And then ask them a thought-provoking question so that they can see that they can learn because the job I have for them is definitely not the job they have now. We'll explore these more in a bit, uh, but let's look at that second one. Can you work with them? That's what fuzzy questions are for. And let's look at one fuzzy question. And since I'm kind of lazy, oh, wait, this one has, oh, yeah. Since I'm kind of lazy, uh, I'm going to go to the book. There's a chapter about integrating hardware and software, an area of embedded engineering that is all about finger pointing and arguing. Um, it can be fun. It can be really bad. But if I'm going to talk to someone about interpersonal skills, one of the things I want to know is that they can do this sort of thing. I started about asking about projects that were successful. I let them talk on a bit just to make sure that they're enthusiastic and proud. But then I ask about projects that were failures. The goal isn't really to hear about the success. The goal is to see if they understand why the failures were failures and how they plan to avoid that in the future. Are they one of those people that say, I was perfect and those around me were idiots, if only they'd listened to me? Or do they say something like, I was terrible, and if they just fired me from the start, it would all have gone better? Are they one of those people who claim not to have been part of any projects that had any failures? I think maybe they weren't very observant. But someone who's aware of how at least one project has failed will be on guard for next time, and I want that for my team. There are lots and lots of fuzzy questions. What are your weaknesses? What do you want to be doing in five years? What are your strengths? 
And we've got time at the end. I'm happy to go through my list and what I look for. But there are plenty of places on the web. You can search for interview questions. And those are the ones you're most likely to get, the fuzzy interpersonal ones. There are also some questions not to ask. Uh, they can be boiled down to don't discriminate. If the person across from you during the interview was a black box, would you ask them the same questions? Does it really matter all this stuff? Can they do the job and can you work with them are the important parts. These are the U.S. laws and I know you're not all U.S. I'm putting these up because worse than being illegal, questions like this are just bad form. I already had my little diversity rant, so I won't reprise it, but don't be a jerk, even unintentionally. And when you're sitting in an interview room, it's kind of easy not to ask these questions, but when you head out to lunch as a group and ask, so, do you have any kids? Well, don't. Let them bring up the things they want to talk about for social stuff. Do you have any interesting hobbies is fine. Or you can just talk about what makes you so awesome and your place of business so great to work at. Before we get to technical questions, uh, it looks like I have a question waiting for me. Um, now is the time to ask about fuzzy questions and questions not to ask. Interviewers who insult the candidate's ability, what to do about them as an interviewer or as an interviewee? Um, since I am hopefully talking to you as interviewers, I am going to have a little bit to say about interviews that go badly. And I would say don't insult the candidate's ability for the very reason that this industry, whatever industry you're in, is frighteningly small. The things that you do today may affect your career, your whole career. I have been in a situation where I have interviewed someone, turned them down for the job I had, and then two years later interviewed at their company where they were interviewing me. So I can't tell you as an interviewee what to do when they insult you, but I can tell you as an interviewer it's a very bad idea to be insulting, denigrating, or even making them feel stupid. It's just bad. Okay. Um, so let's go on to choosing a technical question. Oh, wait, my thing got. Oh, yes, I got a question. What are thinking questions like why are manhole covers round? I'm going to tell you to wait on that one. I will we'll get back to that real soon, I promise. In fact, I'm going to go ahead because that is part of the next section. Um, the easiest thing to ask a, a candidate about is the resume, a simple what did you find most challenging at whatever their last company was or what specifically did you do for insert the name of a project that looks interesting? I focus on the companies I know a little about or the projects that sound similar to what I'm hiring for. I don't approach these with the assumption that the candidate's lying on their resume. More with the idea of finding out if they're interested and proud of what they've done and whether their role was hands-on or more in the periphery. If they're lying, you'll figure it out. You don't have to go in that direction. And now to the good stuff, technical questions. Pitting you against them in a cage match of who is truly more intelligent. Yeah, no, not exactly. There are a lot of technical questions out there, and it depends on what you're hiring for. I'll tell you my two favorites in a minute, but what are you going to ask? I'd say you start by trying to find a small problem that's expandable and let people say no fail the question in a way that doesn't make them feel stupid. As I mentioned before, even if they aren't qualified for the job you have open, you may need them at some other place in your organization, or they may sit on the other side of the desk someday. And everyone has bad days. The second point is know your question. Practice on yourself. Practice on other people. Practice until you are bored with it. What do you want to know? What difficulties can you expect from the average candidate? Don't walk into an interview with a shiny new question and expect it to go well. One example of a technical question I ask a lot 
is for software engineers who have C on their resume. I start off with a little apology that I'd like to get this out of the way, and I ask them about the function string copy. I know my audience here aren't necessarily software engineers and don't necessarily know C, but I kind of want to tell you about it so you can see how tweaky and detailed it is, but also how short it is. I start off asking if they're familiar with the C library function string copy, which is just a way of copying stuff from one place to another. And this is an opportunity to take back what's on their resume. Of course, then they get pointed questions about what's true on their resume, but that happens maybe one in a hundred people I've interviewed. Then I write down the prototype for the function call, leaving the variable names blank. The good candidates will fill this in with source and destination because it's about copying. And I think that's pretty important. If someone names them A and B and then gets the variables confused later, that's really bad planning on their part and shows me their coding style lacks forethought. On the other hand, I don't care about the details, the things a compiler would catch. And I like this function because almost everyone forgets to finish the string off to terminate it. So I have a hint all ready to go that describes what would happen if I tried to run their code having failed to do that step. It's a straightforward question with a slight thing most people error on. And I'm going to say this again because it's really important. Be sure you know the answer to your question, as many answers as you can, because there's no single right way to do this. Ask yourself to write it without the help of the Internet or your existing code, and get very familiar with the tricks and the possibility of failure. For string copy, about 75% of people come up with a good answer, many requiring a bit of help. About 10% of the people write it down, wonder why I'm wasting their time, and what we're going to get to that's interesting. About 5% of the people, about 1 in 20 interviews, they're too senior to code. To me, this is like a novelist who says they're too senior to explain where punctuation goes. It's just mechanics. I don't really hire people to program. I hire them to do other things. But if I'm hiring someone to produce code, I want a small demo of that. However, there's no need for you as the interviewer to argue with them. You run the show. Be polite. Say it's a standard interview question for you and your team, and if they're not comfortable, you can go on. But you have to note it for your team in the wrap-up meeting. And then go on. It doesn't really matter. You might lose a half an hour of your life to someone that you're never going to see again, hopefully. But as long as you're polite, if you do see them again, that's fine. Uh, but let's go back to the technical questions, because I still haven't gotten to the manhole problem yet. Um, like I said, I'm not really hiring someone to program. That's mechanics. I want them to think. And once we get the preliminary dance over with, there's a much better question. What I really want to know is, can I think about a problem, come up with a viable solution, and communicate it with the team? And for this, I use a stoplight. I draw two intersecting streets, four lights, and four sensors for cars. And then I walk through how they would go about controlling all of this. And remember, I'm doing embedded for the most part, so this, but this could be a software problem. It can even be a hardware problem. I've used it plenty of times on quality engineers, making sure they could write a test plan for a stoplight. There are some things I look for. A lot of people ask, is there a turn light? And that's a good thing for them to ask. It shows that they think about what's unclear, and that when marketing brings them something that's not really well defined, they're going to ask questions, think about the problem as a whole. I like it when they name things well. I've already mentioned that. I really like north, south, east, west instead of one, two, three, four, because that means when they talk about it later, it's just going to be easier. Um, and there are some people who notice right off the problem is only half what it seems, since two lights are always in sync. And that's a great thing for them to notice. Not critical, but it definitely is a good thing. And there's some bingo here. I like to hear state machine and flow chart, but that's just solving the problem. Some people get stuck on the initial state, but it's not very interesting, so I can help them along there. And some people ask, well, what about if a sensor's broken? And then they solve that problem. That's a good thing, because that's another one of those, marketing's never going to ask you to solve 
things that are going to happen in the real world. They're always going to say, it's all perfect, it all works just fine. So when you search for a technical question about syncing, try to find something straightforward without a lot of twisty turns, but something they haven't thought about before. I tend to look at the world around me. How do elevators work? How do stoplights work? There are another sort of question, getting back to that uh, question waiting for me. Thinking questions are not puzzle questions, or they're not intended to be puzzle questions. If you heard it on Car Talk, are the world's hardest questions, it's a puzzle. If it involves goats, it's a puzzle, or has a neat twist that you have to know in order to solve it. When I hear about a company who's asking these sorts of questions, and I'm interviewing there, I study for them. If you ask a puzzle question, what you're almost certainly learning is whether they've heard this problem before or how well they hide their frustration if they haven't heard it before. If that's what you're looking for, good, but uh, I'd rather know how they think. Oh, and look, there's a little question on that one. Let me see. Did that answer the manhole cover question well enough? Uh, now I have lots of questions. Okay. Amy, did that answer your question? Hmm. All right. Well, if it didn't, type again into the talk window. Uh, let's see, another question. Would I ask a technical question that I'm fairly sure the interviewee does not know to see if they will admit they don't know it? Ah. Uh, I don't do that much, but I'm not going to say I've never done it. It is often useful to know if someone will admit to ignorance. But I tend to wait until the second interview after they're com comfortable, after they're pretty sure they're doing well. If you try to force somebody into a corner in the first day of interviews or phone screen, there's a good chance they're going to make something up because they think that's what you want. If you can get them to the point where they're comfortable with saying, I don't know, then that's good. As an interviewee, as a candidate, I say, I don't know. Or I say, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the answer to this, if I can you know, slide it over a little bit. Um, oh, what exactly is the stoplight question? I'm sorry. Uh, I asked them how do you control the lights given the inputs from the sensors in the car? So if it's a, let me go back to that slide. Um, so over here on this slide, I have the four-way stop sign, the little clip art. And each place has a sensor for a car, and then there are four separate red, yellow, green lights. And I want them to control what each of the four lights are showing based on the sensors from the cars. And uh, I guess I should have explained that one better, but it's in my book, so uh, feel free to buy that. Let's see, going on, because uh, my queue is clear at this point, I do want to talk about what to do if an interview is going badly. Um, sometimes the candidate is not answering the questions well. They're frustrated. You're frustrated. You want to bail on the whole interview, and uh, and you really can't because then you mess up the day for everybody else. So the question that I and most people that I've talked to ask is, what should I ask you? This lets the candidate talk about something they want to talk about. It lets you figure out what they're good at. For some people, it's just an intermission to let them calm their nerves, and then you can get back to your normal plan and actually have a good interview at that point. It isn't a zero-sum game. Even if they aren't right for this position, there's no need to make them feel bad. You may end up working for them sometime later in your career. The next question, which is both fuzzy and technical, does the candidate have any questions for me? Do they care about the job? Have they been listening to my team talk about what they do? 
when you ask this, be prepared to answer things like, do you like your job, and describe your typical work day. Be sure to know how much you can tell them about your company and your project. Everything on your website is fair game, so you might want to review that or talk to your organizer about what's good to say and what's not. And feel free to pass off things you aren't comfortable talking about, whether they're technical or things like salary. It's easy enough to say, I suggest you ask so-and-so that question and let somebody else clean up the mess. I recommend not putting this at the very end of your interview um, because it tells you a lot about the candidate and I don't think you should run out of time for it. Some candidates will ask you questions all through and you may not ask them that one because they are clearly are interested. But, uh, but if they haven't, then be sure and leave a little bit of time for it. This is a breakdown of a 30-minute interview, but interviews don't go on rails. You have to be flexible. It's a decent place to start. Once you've done it once or twice, figure out how much time you really need. Most organizers will give you a 45-minute slot or even a 60-minute slot if that's what you want. And they like it when you don't go over. So we talked a little bit about some of the frustrating won't answer to see if people won't say they don't know. Um, there are a lot of people like that. They will temporize answers. They uh, go a lot of, along the lines of, well, let's see, I think I believe if you just, well, um, let me think. And, and then there are the people who talk nonstop constantly, you can't ask them any questions, they're going to direct the interview and it doesn't matter what you say because they're going to do what they want to do and they're just going to talk and talk and talk. And then there are the nervous ones. They, they quiver and nearly shake in fear and all you want to do is tell them it's going to be all right. And there are the people who argue when they don't know the answer because they're just, they can't admit that they don't know the answer. They're going to tell you your question's wrong. For the most part, these are just interview behaviors. They may leak into normal work relationships, but they aren't always a good reflection of the characteristics of the person you're talking to, of the characteristics you're interested in hiring. So you're going to have to ask your organizer, do they want immediate impressions so they can escort a candidate out if one or two interviews go badly? Or, and how do they want your feedback, written or in a meeting? Even if they want a meeting, I recommend writing notes on your impressions because the meetings sometimes don't happen for a few days or you end up with multiple candidates. And these meetings can be horrible uh, with some people who are really naturally polite and nice, hating the candidate and not knowing how to say, or other people being loud and negative about some minor feature, though they like the candidate overall. They can be lengthy even when you all pretty much agree. So. At the start of a meeting, I think everyone should, without discussion, secretly write their score for the candidate on a piece of paper and then reveal the scores all at the same time. If the numbers are all eights and nines, then there isn't any need for discussion. Go hire them. If they're all threes and fours, again, not much need for discussion. But sometimes you are holding an eight and somebody else has a five. That's when you need to talk about it. And you should be ready to defend your number, to explain why you liked them or why you didn't, and be ready to change it in light of new information from other interviewers. The scoring system also provides a way to compare multiple candidates across weeks of interviewing, which that's how long it takes. On the other hand, it's just the first pass filter, a starting point for discussion. People can't be summed up with the number. And it does keep meetings short, but remember, it is more than that. Uh, that actually covers my presentation to so far. Do you have any questions? Let's see. I, it's, I'm going to the group chat before Yasmina can add them. Uh, yes, I'll go back to the slide with the interview breakdown. Can I recommend two, do I recommend two scores? No, because if you read 
the scoring chart, which I think is kind of hard, um, it doesn't say their technical ability versus their interpersonal skills. What it says is, I think this person will get stuff done. I think that they can do stuff the day they start. Or I think that we can train them to do this job. So it's more about the whole person and the job you have for them. Um, can we see the interview with the slide breakdown? Let me go back to that one. Um, so there is the allotting time. Um, I'll leave that up for a little bit. And Robin Taylor, how can I investigate the company? How can a candidate investigate a company, specifically the department before applying? Well, you can't always. Um, small companies you can because they may only make one thing. But You can figure out a little bit, you know, the first interviewer you say, what do you make and what is your team like? And then the second interviewer you say, well, what is your typical day and how would I fit in? It is, it's, it's a blind thing to do to apply to a company. And you can't always tell if you're going to fit. You'd be surprised sometimes where you do manage to fit. And hopefully someone will see your resume, like it enough to see that you might fit, do a phone screen, and then that's how they're going to see how the fit works. Um, let's see. How do you conduct the technical portion of your interview when nobody at your organization has the skills you're hiring for? Oof, that's a hard one. Um, you hire a contractor. That's the only thing I can think of. Find a good contractor tell them that has the skills you want. Tell them what you're looking for. And then you and your team have to interview for personal skills and then have the expert in that area uh, interview for the technical skills. And maybe it isn't a contractor. Maybe it's a friend uh, who does have those skills. You do need to know someone uh, or, yeah, that's, that's tough. How would I handle cultural dif differences when someone doesn't like to talk about their accomplishments? That's hard because so many people are like that. And uh, I care about gender, as you might expect. And certainly it's a gender issue. Uh, you can draw them out. They have their resume. If they are completely unwilling to discuss their accomplishments, then there's not much you can do for that. But you can always ask, you know, what, what are you most proud of on this? Or ask them more of the thinking questions. You can get a lot of information about how they can do your job without asking them too much more than is on their resume. Um, what do you do if you see they know the answer to the technical test? but are not answering the same question on a different form. I'm sorry, Aurelian, I don't understand what you mean. Uh, try typing that one in again. What is the best length for technical interviews before the candidate is too tired, stressed, confused to be able to continue? I had lunch with a friend yesterday who was interviewing at Apple, and she said, the way I'm built, I have to eat every two hours, and I don't know what to do. And I told her to take a food bar and apologize. But not everybody is can do that. And it's not always about food, stressed, confused. I would rather have two six-hour interviews than one 10-hour interview day. It's up to you. There is some value to knowing how people react when they're tired. But I like to keep them to six, six hours and then that makes sure that I don't have to schedule 10 hours of interviews for them. Four hours can tell you a lot, but you're definitely going to have to bring them back for a second, which can help, which can be good. Uh, shouldn't I expect that Canada has investigated the company? Yes, I do. I think they, you should at least read the website as a candidate. And is it fair to ask questions that they would know of viewing the website? Well, 
Eh, maybe. Uh, I assume this person is interviewing at five places. At least one other is in your same industry. Do you really want to hear what your competitor's website says? Because that's what, what you might get. If you want to give them a quiz on their reading skills, give them a quiz on their reading skills. I want them to at least have a basic idea of what I do at my company, but I don't need them to quote my website. So you're going to have to find a balance there. Uh, if you make LEDs and you, come, and you ask the candidate, do you know what we do? And they say, gosh, you make software, right? You're Microsoft, right? And at that point, yes, it is kind of a failure for them to not know your basic product. But as another uh, question pointed out, sometimes if you work someplace like Microsoft or Google or someplace big, they may not have any idea what group they're interviewing for. The HR recruiter might have given them some idea, but not much. So it's a balance. I can't really answer that one. What kind of technical questions are better, right, wrong answers, or do you understand X, Y, Z, or explain this? I don't like to ask true or false questions. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance. I like to have better odds than that. Sometimes I'll have them explain a standard industry thing. Um, more often, I will have them explain something that is not really a detail for the industry. So if I was asking someone who was going to be a networking engineer, I would ask them how things get routed around the Internet, not what are the seven levels of the OSI model. It's a level of detail that they might remember. I know there's some nice acronyms for it, but even if they don't remember the specific details, the things they could look up on Wikipedia, I don't ask them that, but really. It's, it's, again, a test of their reading skills, and I want to make sure that they can think. Uh, I hope that answers your question, your first question, Zach. Uh, let's see, Michael says, people are on best behavior as an interview. It turns out to be very difficult it turned out to be very difficult once in the door. How do you try to see past this best behavior? That's what some of those fuzzy questions are for. Um, and one of the fuzzy questions I have that's, that kind of covers that is uh, I got from a, a guy I used to work with. Uh, at every job, there are things you do because everyone agrees they must be done. Then there are sidetracks along the way where someone realizes you have to take a detour to build a new tool or something kind of boring. Can you give me an example of this someplace where you realized there was a need for something and you sold your team on it? That's another one of those where people will a lot of times say, maybe not in so many words, but effectively say, I was right, they were wrong, they were idiots, if only they'd done what I'd said. And that's an indication their communication skills are not very good or their leadership skills are not the best. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes you end up working with people you don't want to work with. But for the most part, you need to figure out how to get things done. Um, but if you don't have somebody who asks a question like that, and it's, that's one of the reasons to talk about your whole interview team is make sure you all ask a variety of questions. Um, that's what background checks are for or uh, reference checks are for. It's, it's an important part of the process. You, your team lead should call up and say, would you work with this person again? And that's the important one. Um, all of this, what do you think so-and-so's greatest weakness and strengths are, are to disguise, would you personally ever work with this person again? Um, from Rob Mitchell, hey, that name looks familiar. How do you decide the breakdown of questions, technical thinking and personality for candidates in other disciplines, such as hardware? Well, it depends on who I'm interviewing with. Um, if it's me interviewing a hardware engineer for a small company where there are no other hardware engineers, I ask a lot more technical questions um, because I'm one of the few people who can speak a little bit of hardware in that situation. And then I let the rest of my team worry more about thinking and personality. I, I had my, oh, the, a lot of time is up there are still 
Um, and that's kind of my basic allotment for anything I'm interviewing for. A little bit of technical, a little bit of thinking, a little bit of personality. And then if, if I don't get what I need, I'm not shy about asking for another interview slot. If, some, if I get a hardware engineer who aced my hardware questions, um, but I didn't get a feel for whether or not I could work with him, I'm happy enough to just say, well, this was cool. I want to talk to you again. Is there, Zach asks, is there an optimal number of questions to be asked during the face-to-face -face interview? Ten questions total? Three? Five? Oh, uh, well, I still have the allotting time up there. I'm going back to that. So just with this, I ask, let's see, one, two, three, four, five questions total because my long technical question can be pretty long. And the questions from the interviewee, I do want to give them time for that because I want to know what they're thinking. And it, yeah, I, it depends on what you ask. Is string copy one question or three the way that I lay it out? Is my tell me about your successes and then tell me about your failures, is that really two questions or one? I can't give you a hard number on that. I would try to figure out what you're looking for and tailor it to that. What do you personally want to know? And do these questions answer what you personally want to know? Not worry about numbers. Thoughts on a startup founder interviewing a potential co-founder CTO? Uh, Akbar is a scientific programmer and needs to partner with a good web programmer. That's another one of those, I'm hiring for skills that I don't necessarily have and I'm not sure how to ask about. Find an expert, have them interview them. Just because someone doesn't work for you doesn't mean they aren't going to give you a good interview. They aren't going to be able to conduct a good interview on your behalf. Um, that would be the best way to go about that. You might be able to learn enough about web programming to ask a few good questions. You might get away with explain web programming to me or explain whatever detail of web programming you're most interested in to me and have five people explain it to you. And whoever can teach you the best might be a good partner. For a CTO, it's really important they have the communication skills to describe why what they're doing is important. But even so, I would find someone else to interview them, someone who you respect who has those skills. Or maybe it's a friend of a friend who has those skills. Phil King talking about hardware engineers. Um, how do you handle interviewing your friends or coworkers from previous jobs? That's kind of funny. I had to interview Phil for a, a job. Um, I don't like to interview my friends, but it does happen because sometimes you work someplace and you kind of know a guy. You know him well enough to go out to lunch, but you don't know him well enough to know if he's going to get at his job. Uh, and so you interview them with the same set of questions you asked the last guy. Maybe you take a 10-minute shorter slot because you are pretty sure your interpersonal is okay. And candidates answer questions in a written technical test but gives the wrong answer <laughs> answers during the interviews. What do you do? Is the technical test live? Did they do it in place? Were they there at your business? Are you confident that they answered the questions for your technical test? That's an important thing to me. If I give a test and they get it right offline but not with me, then I have to wonder who did their test. And I would creep back to the exact questions that were on the test. And if they could answer them well enough, even though they can't ask, answer my side questions, then I would give them the benefit of the doubt. But if they can't in person answer the same questions they could have answered an hour ago, I don't know. I would probably confront them, but I tend to confront the people and say, I don't understand. Can you explain what is happening here? Some people, I know, I can think of one person who would have been nervous enough to get things wrong 
just because they were that nervous. Um, if, on the other hand, they gave you answers written and it was at your place of business with no Internet, then uh, I might give them the benefit of the doubt. Some people write better than they speak. Certainly I do. Uh, let's see, one more question from Robin Taylor. What if a candidate has no references? Oh, returning to the workforce after more education or travel. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't get references when you're getting education. Your professors are a fine place to get more references. Um, references from before they left the workforce are fine. At some point, character references. Maybe they only have two older people, people they worked for before they left the workforce, but none, none is scary. Um, so I don't, I would ask them to dig deeper. And if necessary, you know, if they were raising kids and involved with charity and PTA work, fine, give me a reference for that. I just want to make sure you're not a, a complete nutball. And... So I would be happy to expand what I considered a reference before I would take no references. Oh, do I ask why they want to work for me or for my company? Yeah. Um, that's often small talk or, or, or lunchtime things. I am... I've gotten that question from companies like Apple where they, they really want people to be very excited about their vision. Um, and I have trouble answering it because I don't – I like working at small companies better than big companies. So if I, I get the are you excited to work here question, I have to either pretend or be honest. Um, but I do occasionally ask it because some of the places I've worked – you have to be excited because it's a startup. We don't pay well, and um, what we work on is hard. So, yeah, I think that's a good question to ask. Um, but I would turn it around on you. Why do you want to know? Do you want to know that they're enthusiastic, or do you want to know that they read your, web read your website, or do you want to know um, that they care at all? Because there are plenty of engineers out there who go through life not really caring about what they do. They just push the buttons. Um, I think it's a good question to figure out if they're enthusiastic about something. Uh, anything else? We are almost out of time. And up there you see my, on the slides, there's my book. I do have a Twitter feed. I'm still not sure what Twitter is useful for, but I gather that's a common problem. And my company, uh, I'm an embedded systems consultant as well as uh, writing the book for O'Reilly. I really appreciate that you came and listened to me. Thank you so much. And if you have any other questions, feel free to tweet me or it's easy enough to contact me on the web once you get, me to, once you get to the website. As Yasmina is pointing out, there are some more webcasts coming up. I have one in November about embedded systems, and there's one on Thursday about program management. So thank you very, very much, and have a lovely day.